Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. Today we're doing a, uh, a long-awaited podcast. I feel like a lot of people ask us about you know, going out and just getting good at locating deer, killing deer, and we got the perfect guy on for that right now. We got Mr. Jonathan Bone from Catman Outdoors. Jonathan, how you doing, man? Pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing good. Probably not as good as you. Uh, how you doing, Jacob? <laughs> doing well. Still, yeah, definitely not doing as good as uh, as Jonathan's doing. Uh, before we get started, Jonathan, we asked you how many deer you killed this year, and it's only October 19th by the time we're recording this, and you had to sit there and think for a second, and then came up with a total of 15 deer, counting five depredation tags you had in Indiana. Uh, so you're off to a hot start, dude, and especially when somebody, when I was looking for somebody to cover this topic of getting on and just in having success killing deer. Like we're not so much, I'm not going to focus so much on the conversation of, you know, some of our past episodes where we try to focus on mature bucks, but the guy is going out bow hunting specifically and they want to get good at just getting opportunities. Uh, you kill a ton of does every single year. You kill a bunch of bucks too, but you kill a ton of does, uh, both on public and private land. So I think this is a great, you're a great guest to kind of hit this conversation for us because there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast that this might be their first year they've ever picked up a boat. Maybe maybe they've been gun hunting for the last 15 years, or maybe they're just brand new into, into gun or into hunting general in general. And they're looking at opportunities at, you know, that they have. And a lot of these guys are trying to pick up a bow for the first time, or maybe they've only been bow hunting for a handful of years, but they just haven't had the success um, that they're really looking for at just getting opportunities at, you know, some of their does some of the bucks and everything else in general. And maybe they're not so focused on just the mature bucks as well. But Jonathan, to kick us off, you've got a really interesting story and you've been on the podcast before in the past. It's been a few years now, but I want you to tell your story about how you got into hunting, specifically when you come from a family family that really doesn't have any hunters in your family yeah none at all um i i guess I, i'll try to keep it as general and brief as possible but i always was into the outdoors growing up uh anything outdoors i got i got into fishing when i was like 11 and i think i was 17 we had it was thanksgiving day we had a bunch of turkeys come through the backyard because our subdivision backed up to some property we see deer and turkeys Long story short, I chased the turkeys off, started thinking about how I could catch one and uh, cook it up because I just, I wanted to, you know, like there, there's wild turkeys out there. How do I get one? A lot, uh, one thing led to another. I learned about hunting, regulations, turkey calls, all that, and then and then went on to deer hunting and everything else. So that's kind of where, the, where it sparked, coming from a family that doesn't hunt. That's where the interest kind of first started. But um ever since then I've just got into it and it's, it's like a, it's a way of life now. Yeah, absolutely. Of course you have a successful YouTube channel as well. I know you've been uh, doing that for quite a while, you know, Catman Outdoors. Some of y'all probably know him from YouTube um, and then also through social media. Uh, by the way, guys, if you're not, if you're just listening to this podcast, you need to go to YouTube and look at this because Catman Jonathan's got one of the best backgrounds of anybody we've done a video podcast with quite yet. You need to go look at some of the antlers on the wall and all these sheds he's got sitting behind him. But Jonathan, that, that big one I did not kill just for the record. Yeah. That's the deadhead I found when I first got into it. That that's the uh, Catman logo, isn't it? That deer. Yeah, yeah. I just started my YouTube channel that year, and and uh, didn't really wasn't trying to go anywhere with it, but I wanted to have an actual logo for it, so I had picked that up in the woods behind the church I went to, and uh, was like, wow, I didn't know there was deer this big around here. I had no idea, and uh, I just found it. Uh, I was actually looking to film an albino deer that was in the area at the time, and so that became my logo because that's what I had. <laughs> well, real quick, I, I want to kind of kick this back a little bit on a little bit further back in your story and your journey, especially as you get a little bit more into bow hunting. Um, talk to me, especially from someone who maybe you didn't necessarily have a bunch of mentors, like you didn't have an uncle or your dad necessarily that could take you out and show you the ropes. So a lot of this you kind of had to learn yourself or learn by yourself. But what were some of those hard lessons you learned early on, especially as a bow hunter, when you were just trying to get opportunities at deer? Mm. Honestly, it's not so much opportunities. One of my biggest struggles was making bad shots, getting nervous, punching the trigger, rushing the shot, because it was like every opportunity was exciting. It was like first time, first few times I'd had deer that close and was able to get a shot and the, the adrenaline's pumping. So that my biggest struggle was not so much getting opportunities, which it was at, at sometimes um, to some degree, depending on where I was hunting. But uh as far as getting opportunities, um, 
I just had some periods of time where I didn't know why I wasn't seeing deer. I was like, cause I'd go in, you know, like my first year I started bow hunting is 2012 and I started, uh, on a piece of private property and, uh, it was, you know, like low hunting pressure, lots of deer. And I, I was hunting on the edge of a bedding area. And so I just got some easy opportunities right off the bat. And then I was hunting public land too. I actually killed my first deer on public with a rifle, but, um, taking the bow out on public i didn't kill one till the next year in 2013 over a hot oak tree and uh that i guess that started my focus on feed trees back in 2013 so that was my second year bow hunting because i had killed it was a little little four point and uh that's when i started focusing on food sources and and uh i always ever since the start i've stuck close to bedding cover because i would see more deer and you don't get as many clear open shots if it's real thick but i was seeing more deer and kind of stayed away from the fields because I was always told by people online, people I met uh, on public land, stay away from the fields. Everybody hunts the fields. The deer come out after dark, which is often true, but I just, that's also what I was told. So I, I gravitated towards the thickets. It, with that, so I want to get into this, like the whole thicket aspect and you kind of gravitating toward this as an early bow hunter and how this is really, um, I, I guess, uh, built your, your style, I guess you could say as a whitetail hunter. Um, now you're in Tennessee and I want to ask what is thick bedding cover look like in the general like areas that you typically hunt in? Oh, it could be different, a uh, couple different things. We got a lot of limestone here in the central basin. So there's a lot of cedar glades, cedar thickets of young cedars and even older cedars will still form a thicket. Um, and, uh, and we got the CRP, the grown up fields. Uh, if you're around ag land and they've got crop fields, they'll usually have a few fields sectioned off that are just grown up in weeds. Um, cause they get a tax break or whatever for that. And that's really good for wildlife. Um, that's not so good in, during early season. Cause you know, if you're hunting in chest high goldenrod, in the winter time, they'll bed in that all day, but when it's hot out, they tend to favor the shade. And then we'll have on the, in the creek bottoms, the Chinese privet thickets, which is highly invasive, but deer, deer use it to their advantage. They feed on it and they use it for bedding cover. So privet thicket on a creek bottom, river cane thickets. And, uh, that's usually what our, our thicker cover looks like. And of course, if there's a logging been, if there's been logging going on in your area, there then a cut over, you know, they, they cut like two, three, four years ago is, is going to be prime bedding cover. Now, also, when we're talking about the thickets and everything, one thing you said you learned early on is kind of gravitating towards that because, yeah, you'd have success on feed trees, but it seemed like the closer you got towards the bedding, you'd have more opportunities at deer and see more deer in general. What is your thought process on, especially if we're talking to someone who just hasn't experience the maybe say the shot opportunities that maybe you know you'd be able to come to over the years what are some of those things that you look for like it's i mean it's not as simple as just going set up in a thicket but how do you go to find where you should set up if you're trying to get opportunities of catching deer coming out of those areas no uh, fresh deer sign uh fresh deer sign and um and fresh and old mixed deer sign especially because that tells you they've been in there a while if you're hunting a food source, if you got a feed tree that's real close to bedding, if there's not much sign under it, I mean, it looks good. It's right next to a big thicket and it's a big white oak. But like this year around here has been a pretty heavy acorn crop. So, you know, I'm seeing white oaks with acorns laying on the ground and barely any deer sign. But if you get in there and, and there's fresh deer droppings, deer tracks, cracked open acorn holes where squirrels will chew up the acorns and in, into smaller pieces but if you got like the shell of an acorn just split in two or it's got a big dent in it from from where a deer bit into it it's it's a little different it's real subtle but it's a little bit different sign than, than a squirrel eating on them and then of course the obvious deer tracks and droppings and and uh if you're finding a lot of that like a lot of sign like oh wow there's been multiple deer in here then you got a good wind make sure your wind's not blowing off into that thick cover you might be in a place where deer bed three different directions and you just got to wing it uh, with the wind and hope it works out. But uh, sometimes if you're in an ideal spot, you'll have like one thicket and then a bunch of woods and then that one hot tree. And I try to get, you know, either between the tree and the bedding or right on the tree. If they if the deer aren't pressured, uh, sometimes they'll come out to those feed trees after dark, depending on the whole situation. But um, yeah, the definitely 
deer sign. I mean, you got to have sign that they've been there. It, also, you mentioned something, and I actually uh, found a couple hot features on Andrew's Club uh, about a week ago. And in that spot, not only was it a bunch of droppings, but you had a lot of those cracked holes open. And I uh, did a video on it, and I had a guy, a li- good listener, a uh, uh, longtime listener of the podcast, reach out. And he said he had searched online uh, about the cracked holes, and a lot of people were saying that that squirrels, like, you know, squirrels doing that. But what you're saying is if you had the, the whole hole cracked open, and you, again, you have those big indentures, but it's not all, you know, bit up into a bunch of pieces. More than likely, that's a lot more of the deer sign, not necessarily squirrels doing that, cracking those holes open. Uh, usually, not always, but if it looks like it was open with a nutcracker instead of shredded, then it's more likely a deer than a squirrel. Yeah, absolutely. and if uh, if and it depends on the tree. A lot of acorns separate from the cap when they're ripe, but if you got whole acorns with the cap still on them, and deer pop the cap off, they'll leave, their incisors will leave a notch in the cap which will just look like you took a knife and just cut a notch in it. But a squirrel will actually take chunks out of it. See, that's another really good tip there. Now, also, another thing, because right now in the southeast, especially like where we're at in the deep south, it seems like it's been a really heavy acorn crop year. Uh, we've had a lot of people, and I've ran into situations too, where like you find, maybe you find some feed trees, but it's like they're using it, but they have so many other options. It's not necessarily like a hot spot for deer. Through. So I that's, want- I'm pretty sure that's what's going on in my backyard right now. I just walked the whole property this afternoon to check on all the trees, and we got some big chinkapin oaks. They're just hidden in the middle of the cedar thicket. I know where they are, so I go check them, and they're all dropping, and there's acorns laying on the ground everywhere. And all the red oaks, well, about half of the red oaks are dropping. And uh, you see a little pile of deer droppings here, maybe a little pile there. I found one good rub. Uh, and you can tell they're in there sometimes, but it's not like – old pile sort of fresh pile super fresh pile of droppings it's just like a couple kind of day or two old piles of droppings where they've been in there but they're not spending their time in there they're just going i guess from one tree to the next or passing through yeah now but one thing you mentioned to me a couple days ago when we were talking about this topic is you know the situation you know some people in the deep south may not have like a huge expanse of oaks so it's a lot more isolated oaks and some of these hardwood drainages these little smz's surrounded by pines but if that you're, helps. You know, that's why I was going to bring it with you is if if it's a really heavy acorn crop year, is that one of those times when you'll kind of leave some of those larger hardwood tracks to try to find those more isolated trees? Oh, yeah. You won't see me hunting big woods very much in the, on a heavy acorn year, except during late season, late gun season, because then I can sh- see farther, shoot farther, and then I'm hunting terrain. That's a whole different ball game. During uh, early bow and acorns are dropping heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to spend much time in the big woods if there's just every tree's dropping everywhere and, and there's just food and the acorns are sitting there and sprouting on the ground. Uh, I, if you have it available, it depends where you live and how much land you have access to. But if you got a place, let's say it's a bunch of, I don't know, grown up pasture or just a bunch of like river bottom trees, like, like, uh, uh, silver maples and box elders like worthless trees where you just don't have many oaks but you say you got one ridge and it's got a bunch of big red oaks on it and that's like the only oaks around that can be a hot spot even on especially on a heavy acorn year now on a on a scarce acorn year you can go hit those big woods and find those feed trees i mean you're gonna you're gonna have to walk a lot but but uh scarce acorn years are usually easier to to actually find a hot tree that the deer are hitting repeatedly yeah, that's something that I wanted to ask you about was on those more scarce years, do you find less luck with those really isolated oaks? Because we've all, like, I've tried to find oaks in, uh, dropping in our pine thickets in the past, and it, and I really hadn't considered it till you just said that, but it seems like on bumper years, kind of like this year, where you have a lot, if you find that oak that is kind of isolated out in the thick cover or right on the edge of the thick cover, that, that it's usually a really good spot. But on really scarce years, it seems like that's just not as good of a spot for some reason. It, like maybe the oak's not dropping, you know, obviously that would make it not a good spot. But even sometimes I'll find them dropping and it just doesn't seem like there's great sign on it. And it's almost like the deer have like given up on the mast or something and they're just going and browsing on something else. And they're not they're not feeding super heavy on oaks. Have you ever seen anything similar to that? Um, I, I guess... Not off the top of my head, but I guess I I always do come across oaks that I'd be like, why why isn't there a bunch of deer sign under this? I think my my thinking is you can only walk so much 
and see so many oaks. What if there's a white oak that you don't know about on the neighbors and that's the one they're all feeding on? Maybe that's why they haven't, maybe they just haven't got to that one tree yet. Maybe they haven't found it yet because they're just a little ways over. That's my thinking. I don't know that for sure, but that's kind of what I assume. Also, I mean, there's different oak trees have different, you know, tasting acorns to the wildlife though. And I see that, especially with persimmons. It's uh, around here. It depends where you're at. Some people swear by persimmons. It's been several years since I killed a deer over a persimmon, and I have had deer come straight to it, eating on persimmons. I've killed several that way, but I'd say about 90% of the persimmon trees I find, they're just sitting on the ground. Maybe uh, the coons are eating them, uh, or the turtles, box turtles eat them. And, um, but like finding a hot persimmon tree with a bunch of deer sign is actually not that common where I'm at. Man, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> We talked to a lot of guys, a lot of Arkansas boys who uh, who love hunting persimmon trees, and I've always wanted to kill a deer under a persimmon, and it just had never happened for me. And I've very intentionally tried to do it to the point where, you know, I found it in Alabama where they'll hold. I mean, I got plenty of persimmons that are still holding right now on October nineteenth uh, here in Alabama, and there's just there's they're dropping, but there's no feed sign under it. Kind of like you're saying, there's like a big coon turd under it or something. That's about it. The, the ones the ones I've killed under were the early droppers. Mm -hmm. The ones that I've seen deer sign on and seen deer feeding on was the early droppers that should be should have been dropping a while by now. Uh, the late droppers, I I haven't really focused on them that much, but I haven't really ever found one I would consider hot based on the sign. Um, plus, my hunting style is a little different when I'm rifle hunting. Um, now the early droppers, the big juicy ones that drop in September, October is when I've found the deer sign on them. And I found a few this year. I mean, I found some absolutely loaded trees, some of them dropping, some of them still holding. And I'll check them. And um, sometimes you might find a little bit of sign, but I haven't even found one this year, or I don't think I found one last year that looked hot. Yeah. Uh, also, something I'm really curious about, kind of getting away from the feed tree topic a little bit, because uh, we've hunted some of the same properties that you hunt, and I, I'm really curious about your thoughts on deer trails in general, uh, because, you know, we've all been out in the woods, and we go find just like a beat-down, monstrous deer trail, and uh, and a lot of times we end up hunting that trail, and sometimes we see stuff, a lot of times we don't. Uh, so, I mean, do you ever key in on deer trails? Is that something that you're looking for maybe outside of your regular feed tree uh, routine? um yeah uh, uh, that but it's based off of something else i'm not just blindly picking to picking a worn down deer trail and hunting it like it's got to be between this and that it's, they got i gotta have a reason to believe that they're going to use that trail because a lot of those beat down deer trails are historical highways the deer have used them for for years and um uh, they always just walk the same way so when they do come through there yeah they're going to use that trail more than likely but if they don't have a reason to be there then you're just hunting over old sign yeah. Yeah. And that's especially, I've noticed that in hill country most specifically, uh, because, you know, if they're side hilling around something like the terrain might lay out where they have to walk just right in this one spot. And over the years, they've kind of worn in like a little trail right there. And you, you know, you take a look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, like, it looks like they're just beating this to death. But then you put a camera it on it and there's like a, one deer coming through every three weeks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those historic trails are like that from what i've seen i mean there's probably certain times a year that they use them more maybe the rut maybe in the spring summer who knows if you're seeing fresh tracks like they say it rained recently and you got fresh tracks but you're not seeing anything it's probably nighttime sign mm -hmm. is there is there but, do you ever run cameras in spots like that on those trails um yeah i'll put i've got a couple out now i've got a couple on creek crossings and um, I've got one spot. I was, it's close to where I saw a shooter all summer. And he was from the road. I don't know. He might be dead by now. But I was seeing one from the road. Really nice buck. And the closest, he wasn't on public. So I went to the closest public and put a, tra uh, a camera on a creek crossing. And I've had little bucks and does, you know, raccoons and squirrels. Um, haven't had that deer. I don't know where he went. But it started out slow. And then it picked up and then slowed down and picked up like the deer were coming through there and here recently they've been coming through a little more often. Uh, so I think it depends on time of year. Like wh where are they going to like, um, 
where are the food sources? What's the hunting pressure like? Do they have a reason to use that trail? But I do on trail, it's a trail camera. So I do place quite a few of them on trails and uh, try to 45 degree angle into the trail. So I catch, you have a little bit better chance of catching the deer on camera. And uh, trail crossings, especially, that's two trails in one place, uh, is a great place for cameras. But um, yeah, I know I'll hunt trails and especially trail crossings if it's like, say, right up on some bedding and I know there's a hot food source out that way and they're going to come through then I, I won't just blindly set up on a good looking trail. There's got to be a reason the deer are going to be there during daylight. Yeah. And on that same subject of like the deer having a reason to go from here to there, uh, kind of kicking it back to bedding. You mentioned some good cover that you often find deer bedding in, in your area. Uh, especially this time of year where we're mid to late October, by the time this comes out, a lot of leaves are dropping and the woods are definitely changing i mean they already look different right now just from the understory kind of thinning out but do you see like a a large definite shift in bedding where everything just totally changes after that leaf drop happens and you kind of have to adjust with it um not really the the main change that i've noticed is they they don't need as much shade when it gets colder and they don't have as much shade once the leaves fall off. Um, so in the like early, early season, I'm I'm thinking like like the we got a nice field, it's chest high weeds, goldenrod, all kinds of mixed good good bedding cover and browse, but it's 97 degrees and there's not a not a lick of shade. They might bet on the edge of that curled up field. Uh, but then in like November, December, January, it's cold, 50, 40, 30 degrees, and they'll lay out there. And if it gets super cold, I, they, I think they prefer the the tall fields over the woods or anywhere that gets sunlight. If it gets down in the 20s or teens, depending, like if you're up north, it's going to be a little different. But down south where it, where it gets unseasonably cold, they'll bed in the sun intentionally. Um, so, yeah, I, I see that kind of shift. But other than that, I mean, there's still thickets. Privet, thick, privet doesn't lose its leaves that that well. Uh, actually, most years it doesn't lose its leaves until January, or some some privet won't even lose its leaves at all. So you've pretty much got the same cover year round. So they're still going to use that cover. Do you feel like when uh when the leaf drop starts happening that they get sucked into that cover even more? Mm, not what I've noticed, and I still see them bed out in in open woods. If you're in hill country, uh they will gravitate towards cover. Say you got several hundred acres of big open hardwoods and hills and hollers, and you've got one cut over that's real thick. Yeah, they're going to gravitate towards that, but they're also going to bed out in the open and use the terrain to bed. Mm -hmm. So I found, I don't know how many, I don't know how many times I've jumped deer or found beds like just off the side of the ridge down into a holler where deer bed there in the wide open during the day. Mm hmm now, Jonathan, one thing I've always been curious about and I've really wanted to ask you, just kind of following along with you, is you're hunting in high traffic areas, you're hunting around a lot of deer, you kill a lot of does, but it seems, I mean, you stay on the bucks really well. You usually kill a nice buck and like, man, you're always posting videos of bucks that you've passed or, or that you've seen, like really impressive deer. So, I mean, it's not like you're just out there shooting does all the time, like you're having encounters with nice bucks. So... How does that factor in to the equation here? Like, are you just hunting deer at large? You're just trying to get where the deer are at? Or are you kind of micro-adjusting yourself to maybe get on those bucks? Um, For the most part, I'm just hunting where deer are at, hunting as many places as I can. And when I do find an area that bucks seem to favor, then I'll typically be very selective about hunting those spots. If I'm seeing, like, multiple different deer, different age class two-year-olds, three-year-olds, yearlings. I don't know, like the bucks like this area for some reason. Usually it's real diverse. Got a lot of different type of habitat in one area is where I find bucks a lot. But uh, when I do find those places, I, I hunt them more carefully and and I might kill a doe or two, but then I'll kind of like, if I'm seeing bucks while I'm doe hunting, I'll back out and save it for the rut. Or if I think I can move in there during bow season. I've got one, I've actually got a, real nice mature deer that showed up on camera a few times in one of my old doe killing spots. I always, I mean, I've had bucks show up there on occasion, but this deer was there, left a huge rub before season, 
showed up the first week in the season on camera. Then I go in, try to hunt him. Wind is wrong, screws me over. Then he shows back up a week or two later on camera during the daylight. I go back in, wind is perfect, don't see anything. And it's right up against the bedding area. It's so like, like I said, it's a doe killing spot. And it's like a little couple of red oaks next to a thick bedding cover. And it's a place I always just go to see deer and kill one. But uh, now that I've got this older buck that's showing up on occasion, I'm not killing a doe there. I'm, like, I'm waiting for the right conditions to go in there and hunt. So I don't specifically look for bucks that I, I mean, I guess I do, but I more, more often just find them while I'm hunting in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've had, we've had a couple guests in the past kind of talk about that same thing that if you just put yourself where the deer are at, which this is one reason we wanted to do this episode is, uh, is it's just a good skill to have. Like, you know, people might get a little too wrapped up with like, they got to go kill that, you know, eight year old buck, you know, meanwhile, they're, they're having trouble getting on does or whatever. Uh, so it's like a good skill to have to be able to kind of locate that nucleus of deer and kind of stick with them. Um, so yeah. And, and about, about killing that one eight year old buck or whatever, if you have a, if, if you're hunting a specific buck and you kind of know his habits a little bit, he might not be near any other deer. And, and I don't have as much experience with targeting one specific deer. I did kill an eight year old buck that was checking doe bedding in the early rut. And that's why I was hunting there because that's when I had seen him the year before and other bucks. So it was around the edge of a down, downwind edge of a bedding area. So, um, but yeah, uh, as far as just finding deer in general, you'll stumble into some bucks, you know, especially nice two-year-old, three-year-old bucks. Uh, most people out on public land are going to shoot a, a decent two-year-old. It's got a rack to look at and they're, they're fairly, dumb compared to older bucks yeah so i do stumble into, i stumble into a lot of that just because i'm covering ground scouting i scout all season long well one interesting thing that you said there that i kind of want to dig into a little bit more is you were talking about if you if you feel like you have a good chance at a buck in an area i think you just said you might only shoot one or two does in there so exactly how much pressure do you put on these spots like how like let's say that you go in and you find a, a river cane thicket in a bottom that deer are bedding in and there's a couple of really good feed trees on the edge of it and there's a bunch of deer in there i mean how are you determining how often you should go in there and how much pressure you should put on that spot it depends on how how uh how well i can get in there in and out of there and the wind like can i slip in there quiet and not leave scent everywhere uh, just have a straight trail in easy access which it can be a long ways from a truck but if i have a straight good way to get in undetected and out i'll hunt it more often when the conditions are right but in general um in general i if i hunt a spot more than two or three times in a season i'm hunting it a lot like that's how much i move around it's okay. not that I can't go back in there and hunt it 10 times. I just would rather not because I feel like if there's an older deer in there, the more times he comes in late, like he could come in 11 o'clock at night and smell that I was there. The more times he knows I was there, probably the more elusive he'll become if it's an older deer. For does, it just depends. They get, they move around on based on food sources and hunting pressure. They don't move far. Um, but like this spot over here may be on fire for a couple of weeks and then it's dead for the next month. So uh, that's, you know, I'm, I move around and try to keep the pressure off of one spot and scout and have as many spots as I possibly can. So I'll be like, well, Hey, I want to go shoot a doe or two today. Already killed a doe out of that spot. Camera went dead on that spot. So I'll move the camera, scout this spot, no sign. And I'll go hunt. I've got, you know, I don't know how many dozen spots in the back of my head I can check out and, and you know, just try to stay in the deer. Now, Jonathan, you just mentioned a couple things right there that uh, I think is going to be interesting uh, for someone that doesn't have as much experience as you is in how much you like to move around and hunt different areas. Like, you you know, if you hunt an area more than a couple times, that would be, you know, a lot for potentially for a season. You know, some areas might hunt, you know, a handful of times. Others you might be in one time and that's it. For for somebody looking at through the lens of somebody somebody doesn't have a lot of experience, whether it's on a piece of pro, like a specific piece of property or just in hunting in general, and maybe they don't have those dozens or you know twenty thirty forty different spots they can go check out that they know off the back of their head. 
what would you recommend for those people to do? You've mentioned a lot about scouting throughout the season, but what would you mention for those guys that, you know, maybe have only hunted a piece of public a couple times and they're really trying to cut their teeth on it, or they've only, you know, had access to this private lane, whether it's a hunting club or a lease for like this year, and they haven't really spent a whole bunch of time out there. What would you tell those people and those listeners and viewers to focus on so they can start building a, a, I guess a back catalog of spots they can kind of go back into and scout throughout the rest, the, the rest of the season, but also have it different areas they can kind of jump around to and move a little bit. Um, the way I, the way I would recommend the way I usually do it is hunt in the morning, you know, till nine, 10, 11, 12 o'clock, however long you want to sit in the morning and then get down, pack a lunch. Don't go down, don't, don't go to, to McDonald's and eat lunch and come back to hunt in the evening. Spend the midday scouting new spots. And when you're at home, look at the map, look at Onyx or whatever map you got and and say, that spot looks good. I, I need to check that out. Drop some pins so you don't forget those spots. And then whenever you're out there hunting on whatever property, if you haven't been over there yet, get down and go and check it out. So you say, this looks like a good spot or I don't see any sign or food here. Write it off, move on to the next spot. How valuable if you're limited? Well, no, sorry, go. I was just gonna say if you're limited on land, like uh, if you don't have a lot of public or you're limited to one private property, it can be tough. And if the deer aren't there and you're hunting it and you and the sign's not there, you're not seeing anything, it might be time to either take a break or start looking for another property. Uh, because they'll they'll be back around. Like my backyard, I don't hunt all the time. The deer come and go here. Like if I was limited, I'm I'm living on 60 something acres. If I was limited to hunting here, I'd be screwed half of the season. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, another thing uh, that I'm really interested in getting your take on, you're talking about scouting a whole bunch throughout the season. And to me, this, that's something that gets me always excited. Like I love doing that. If you have the opportunity again, like midday, slip out to a spot and start covering some ground and, and try to find some of that fresh sign that's actually relevant, relevant for right now. How much value do you put on in season scouting versus like postseason scouting versus like scouting the summer. Um, postseason scouting is learning new areas, and the deer trails are really visible because the ground is wet and the leaves are off the trees. You can just see deer trails a lot better, uh, and it's good for finding last year's rut sign rubs. Uh, not so much scrapes, but rubs, old rubs, and last year's buck sign. Um, uh, it's good for getting an getting a feel for it an area or a property summertime i like to go out and watch fields we got some ag fields i like to look at deer in the summer and see get, get an idea what kind of bucks are in the area and uh and how many does have got fawns that kind of stuff but then in season scouting is when i'm finding out where are the deer right now because i need i don't need to be where i saw them in august i don't need to be on that trail that was beat down in february i need to scout during season to know where where the deer are at now. And if you're hunting the same property year after year, you'll notice a pattern. Like the deer are gonna be, you know, over here in, in November during the rut, or this oak tree drops every two years and they're always on it. You'll get patterns if you're hunting the same property where you won't have to scout. You just, you can set your stands and leave them alone until the time is right. And But if you're just starting out, you gotta scout. You gotta be out there to find out where the deer are. Otherwise you'll just be lucky stumbling into them. Would you put in season scouting at a higher tier of importance compared to like postseason and summer scouting? Um, I guess so. I guess if I had to pick one, if I was only allowed to scout spring, summer, or fall, I would. It would have to be fall because I'm not going to go scout spring or summer and then go in blinds during deer season. Yeah, just because I, I mean, I know there's deer in the area, but I need to know. We're talking bow hunting here, right? I need to know where I can get within 20, 30 yards of a deer. You know, not the general area. Now, one one thing you can do if you got time, if you want to burn an evening or a morning, get out in an open space where you can see a good ways and see if you see any. Do an observation set. That'll get that's some good uh, in season intel that doesn't require crashing through the bedding and all that. But uh, at the end of the day, it's a deer. It's gonna it's gonna even if you go through all the woods and spook a bunch of deer, they're gonna come back. Just go through it one time and figure out where you want to hunt and then wait for the right wind and come back and hunt it. 
also now while we're talking about bow hunting, cause at some point I do want to kind of talk about how you transition to gun hunting uh, or like muzzle or any kind of firearm for that matter. Um, but while we're talking about bow hunting and we're talking about wind and all that kind of aspect, uh, in picking the right wind again, for listeners out there, you know, explain to them, you know, what kind of situation do you want to see, you know, when it comes to wind, especially if you're talking about hugging tight to that bedding, you mentioned you don't want the wind blowing into that bedding, but I mean, is it just wind in your face coming from that thick area, kind of blowing out the direction the deer are wanting to, or do you like hunting a crosswind? What is your thought process when it comes to setting up with specific kind of wind conditions? It depends on the spot, but I like, I hunt a lot of crosswinds. If it's in my face coming out of the bedding, that's perfect, but um, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to not be blowing to the deer before they get to you. Uh, so I do hunt a lot of crosswinds and uh, do pretty well that way. Uh, thermals are, especially early season when it's hot, thermals are crazy. Um, so you get a lot of swirling wind, thick cover, like we got the cedar thickets around here. If you're on the downwind side of a cedar thicket, especially if you're on the ground, your wind's going to be doing some crazy stuff because that those cedars act as a wall. And you know, if you blow, you know, blow wind at a wall of cedar trees on that downwind side, it's going to swirl back into the woods. Uh, so you got to you got to pay attention to terrain, thermals, and this is not something you're just going to pick up and learn. You're going to have a bad wind, and I've been hunting for years, and I have bad winds all the time. Like I got screwed uh, hunting that that big buck I've got on camera the first time I sat in there we had a perfect forecast wind I go in there it's dead calm I'm like this wind needs to pick up so it doesn't drift back into bedding well the wind picks up and is blowing the wrong way for three hours and that's not what the forecast said but sometimes you get screwed and, I, and on hindsight I wish I had just climbed down and left Yep, I've had that situation and a, a new piece of public that I well not really new but a piece of public I've scouted in the past and went back in there and again in season scouted found a lot of really hot bucks on right now and there's a lot of mass crops dropping or a lot of mass trees dropping a lot of oaks are dropping but um, it's hard to kind of pinpoint any specific feed sign but the the thick covers there and the two times I've gone in there the wind was supposed to be coming out of the northwest and it was when you're up on top of the ridges but just how how the that creek drainage that you use is kind of as a, or I use as an axis going back into that spot that wind would roll over the top of that ridge and suck straight from the south, blowing directly opposite of where it should be blowing, um, you know, in that spot. And I've gone in there twice, and it's done that both times with northwest winds when the wind speed was over, you know, four or five miles an hour, which is frustrating. Uh, and it's one of those spots, the same yeah. thing. You know, I went to that spot one morning and sat for an hour and a half. The wind never switched. I'm like, I'm not staying here any longer because I don't want to blow any of these deer out. So I decided to hike back to the truck early um, just to hopefully not do as much damage as if I would have sat there for, you know, four or five more hours. Um, but th that is a very frustrating thing, especially in this early season with leaf on conditions. Um, the wind swirls really, really weird where like you do notice that when the leaf, when the leaf drop happens, it seems like you get a little bit more consistent breeze, you know, during that time of the year. And also the th oh, yeah. thermals, everything can heat up quicker in the mornings with the thermals because there's no leaf, there's no uh, leaf shade cover from the trees that kind of keep the ground cool. Um, so you get a rising thermal a little bit quicker. And then also in the evening, you typically get, you know, a, a pretty good falling thermal uh, as well as that shade. Yeah, they're so. less, the thermals are less intense when it's not, when it's cold out. Uh, and when it's hot out, I mean, if you look down the road, you can see the heat rising off of the road and you don't see near as much of that in the, in the winter or the late fall when it's cool. It's, it's more of more of a gradual steady rise and fall. And yeah, if you got like a light wind, like less than five mile an hour wind forecast, it's going to be almost calm. Then in the morning, you know, it's going to still be dropping down into those bottoms. And then in the evening, it's going to drop down in those bottoms so depending on when if the deer are moving earlier or you're real close to bedding it's going to be risky getting in there late in the afternoon but if i got a bad swirly wind and i might not go up there till an hour hour and a half before dark because that's when the wind dies down and thermals die down and it starts going straight down the hill where i want it to do and you may just have to still hunt your way in but i try to avoid I try to avoid that. I pretty much just go out and wing it, get out there and see what the wind is doing, see if I can work my way around where it's not blowing into bedding. And you're going to get, I mean, you're going to get busted. You're going to have bad winds. That's part of it. Also, Jonathan, now, one thing about you is you get quite a bit of opportunity to go and hunt. 
Um, early on uh, in your hunting, I guess you could say, career, when you were first kind of getting started, you probably didn't have as much time, but maybe you did. What would be something you'd recommend for a guy who can only hunt maybe one day or maybe two days at the most a week if he gets that opportunity to go hunt? What would you recommend for someone like that to kind of stay on the deer, but also hopefully get opportunities to be able to actually shoot a deer with their bow? Um, uh, trail cameras help with that kind of thing. Uh, definitely. I mean, go out there and scout midday still. I mean, use every chance you get to, to figure it out. Uh, maybe if you got two days to hunt, maybe use the first day to kind of observe and scout, maybe climb up for a couple hours and watch a uh, holler or something or whatever. It depends on your property. Uh, some places are going to be a lot easier to figure out in less time. In some places it's going to, I mean, it's going to need more time. It's going to be a more of a struggle. It depends on the property you're hunting really. Uh, just make the best of, of what you, what time you've got. Now, let me ask you this as well. You know, a lot of things we're talking about really kind of falls under the classification of woodsmanship. And, you know, with that being said, what are some other important factors, especially as we're talking about bow hunting here, um, that are important woodsmanship skills that especially a new bow hunter should be aware of and should pay attention to and just start learning as they're kind of moving through, you know, going throughout this fall? Um, subtle deer sign would be one. Um, and obviously we're bow hunting. This is kind of a given, but, you know, set up close to the sign. Don't set up where you can see a deer 50 yards out. Set up where you want to come under you. But, uh, scouting, going through the woods, just general woodsmanship. Pay attention to the different kind of plants. You don't have to know the name of all of them, but if you notice that this one type of plant always has the tops eaten off and, and uh, this other type of plant is never touched, then you know, pay attention to the stuff the deer like and pay attention to how much it's been eaten on. Because, you know, if you have more deer concentrated in one area, you have more browse, more signs that deer have been browsing. And um, browse lines on the edge of fields. Some of the places I hunt are really overpopulated, and there's a browse line in the whole woods where from like four feet down, there's no leaves on the shrubs or trees. But a, a normal healthy deer herd, you'll see that browse line on the edge of a field where they come out in the field and they they nibble on the trees, the overhanging limbs on the field edge. If you got a lot of deer, you'll see that pretty well-defined line. And uh, let's say you're hunting a property that's got three fields. I don't care if they're pastures, bean fields, whatever. Um, and they all back up to woods. In mean, field one, there's not much of a browse line on the edge. Field two, there's a browse line in the corner and then field three, there's a big browse line. Say for example, you, you know, deer spending more time in field three. Now also. That's, just something you can, that's something you can see from a distance as soon as you walk into property. Absolutely. Now I want to talk about what does a browse line look like and what does browse pressure on plants look like for someone that doesn't understand what that looks like. You know, what do those plants typically look like when you're talking about the tops being nipped off? Um, you look, you see a plant has got, leaves coming out the side and then it's got it gets up to a bud it'll either have a flower head or it's still growing it's going to have little leaves coming out the top and if it's just a chopped off stem looks like something literally took a bite out of it um if you see a lot of chopped off stems that means it's probably deer munching on it and you'll see that with all kinds of different shrubs uh herbaceous plants that die off in the winter you see it in the summer on those and then uh tree low-hanging tree limbs and shrubs woody shrubs they'll do it you'll, you'll just see the ends of them like looks like somebody like just chomped the the whole end of the stem off because deer favor that new growing stem on the on the very tip so you'll see um you have to look close you know to notice that but a browse line you can see from a distance that's where there's a lot of deer in one area frequently and there's a noticeable line where from about four feet off the ground about where a deer can reach without standing on its hind legs from about four feet up and down, there'll be noticeably less foliage. So noticeably less green and it'll go. So it'll go from a lot of green greenery to a solid line where it's just gray and, uh, or less, it depends on how, you know, how many deer are in there. Uh, if you're seeing that everywhere, uh, you've got too many deer. If you're seeing it, like I said, on field edges, that's a good way with a more healthy deer herd. Uh, field edges are a good way to see from a distance like hey yeah the deer are definitely favoring this field because there's a noticeable line of overhanging trees and shrubs where the leaves just stop about four feet above the ground 
Yeah, see, I, I'm glad we brought that up because you hear people talk about that, but again, some listeners may not even have seen that, and it's kind of funny because if you'll drive around, especially in some subdivisions, especially areas that have a lot of deer, like no matter like oh, where yeah. you live, you'll notice that in subdivisions and like you know, kind of more suburban areas, where like you'll see the back of someone's yard, and like like you said, there's a browse on the backyard where any overhanging branch that's like at that four feet mark or lower there's nothing growing on it but everything above it's nice and green it's like there's a lot of deer there and they're just feeding on all those edges you'll see that in the suburbs a lot because deer get concentrated in the pockets and um you know they have you know their habitat's not it's their habitat's different it's a bunch of houses and stuff and you know yeah they'll come up and eat people's landscaping but they're going to bed in those pockets of woods and they're going to eat everything make a solid line um what was that something else i was going to say about that i forget what but yeah that's something you can see from a distance is uh oh that's what i was going to say a good example if you're uh on a like a cow farm cows will have a browse line about i haven't gone out like measured it but probably about a foot or two higher than a deer so it's more visible if, even from a distance where they've eaten stuff off the trees and stuff up to about five feet off the ground a little it's a little taller and more noticeable than a deer browse line but deer do the same thing when they're in concentrated in high numbers now another thing you mentioned was earlier when we're talking about like the woodsmanship skills that you know a, a bow hunter needs to pay attention to is subtle deer sign now what would you classify as subtle deer sign and, and what does that tell you about an area and something maybe you'd focus on at different times of the year that would be the tops of plants browsed off and stuff in the woods where you don't have a browse line where you're going through the woods and it just looks like green, you know, all, you know, little plants and shrubs all over the ground, trees and what it just looks like you're in the woods. But if you look real close at some of those green plants, you'll see the tops nibbled off. And if you're not paying attention, you walk right past that. That's kind of subtle deer sign. But if you're seeing that here and then you walk over there 50 yards and you're not seeing that, well, then deer were coming through the first spot a lot more. Um, and it depends on the type of plant. So, you know, to pay attention to what type of greenery the deer are eating on and you get less of that greenery going into later season, things are dying off. Privet, uh, it's highly invasive around here, but privet holds onto its leaves a long time. And, and so that's something that deer will uh, browse on almost year round. Yeah. And another thing that we all have in the Southeast is greenbrier. And there's a couple of different species oh, of greenbrier. And that's one that's you so, love it. And see that yeah, exactly. And that's something that you'll see them. They don't just eat the leaves, and, but they'll eat the actual stem itself. And you'll see that in a lot of places, especially with pretty good deer numbers, where like you'll see a stalk of a greenbrier come up and you know a foot and a half off the ground, it's nipped off completely. And you'll get in a patch of greenbrier, and it's all like that. That's a good indicator, deer that deer using an area. I think a lot of that browsing on greenbriars earlier in the summer and spring because. Greenbrier gets a hard green stem with really sharp thorns, and I don't think the deer are eating that. I think they're eating the new growth in the early earlier in the year when it's young and tender, and they get the new growth. That's when they're nipping the tops off of it. But that still tells you that that there's you know good deer numbers. If you're seeing greenbrier, uh, a lot of people call it sawbrier. Uh, if you're seeing a lot of that stuff um, all over the woods and it's all nibbled on, that means you got a good good number of deer in those woods. Um, that's kind of a more general thing to look for. That's not telling you deer are there right now. That's just telling you there have been deer there over time. So you're in a good starting place. Yeah. And some guys will talk about, we've had guys on podcast that it's a really good, like late season food source when all the mass crops down and you know, that's the only yeah, thing really left out there. Leaves. Yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll nibble on. And there was a, there was a time in my life and I'll be honest, it wasn't that long ago that I did not realize because I, we, we hunt in areas with pretty high deer numbers. I didn't realize that Greenbrier produces a whole bunch of leaves if there's not a lot of deer around because most of the Greenbrier patches <laughs> I come to, there's no leaves. It's just no thorns. leaves on it. But it's, it's like the, strawberry bush. Uh, strawberry bushes like that. Mm -hmm. um, same. And that's uh, they like that more than Greenbrier, I'd say, because if there's any deer in the area, you're not going to find an intact strawberry bush with all its leaves. Yeah, they're always just chopped off. Um, and they also are evergreen. Greenbrier, strawberry bush are both evergreens. They grow in the shade and in, in the woods. Find them a lot in hardwoods and pines. So you'll you find them, you know, when you're scouting the woods, looking for acorns or whatever. Uh, that's a good indicator that, that are deer are in the area. I would never 
I've never hunted over it like Greenbrier. Like, oh, there's a patch of a sawbriar here. I'm gonna I'm gonna set up on it because the deer like it. Now, I mean, they, there's got to be some kind of deer sign because they're they eat that stuff year round. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, one other another thing, talk about woodsmanship, and you did an excellent video on this. It might have been almost probably two years now, where you highlighted every oak species, at least every one that you get your hands on. Uh, and kind of showcase what the leaves looked like, the bark, the tree, the acorn, everything else. And that video had awesome response. I've gone back to it, and the comments on it are fantastic. The views is unbelievable on it. But when you look at all those different oak species, because I'm still someone that, like, you know, of a very general understanding of, of, of oaks, but not in, like, the detailed understanding, like, say, like, a guy like yourself has. When you're looking at all these different oak species, uh, when you're looking at a, a potential feed tree or a species that maybe get targeted early for something that maybe get targeted in November or December or late season, what are some of those species, at least in your area that maybe are hotter early season versus some of those species that will get a little bit hotter, you know, later in the season? Um, if you're in the big woods, black oak seem to drop pretty early or start dropping pretty early. Again, I don't really hunt big woods in that often in the early season but I have noticed they start dropping early. Um, we we kind of got a, a general good, I mean, the Schumard oak here is, is super common and it's kind of a general from beginning of season to end of season. If it's a good year, like this year, I think I'm going to be on deer feeding on those till the end of season, but I've got ones that started dropping in late September. And then there you get some that hold into November, December and especially on a heavy acorn year, there's going to be leftovers, you know, after season. So that's, uh, that's one species there that we got the super common around here. That's a red oak. And I mean, it's pretty much a season long deal. It's, and then I'm still, you know, I'm checking all the white oaks. I'm checking different types of red oaks. It doesn't matter if it's got acorns on the ground, I'm looking for deer sign regardless. So, uh, around here, the Schumard oak, for sure is my go-to. I've killed more deer under them than any other type of oak, but as it depends where you're at. Uh, if you're in the bottoms, like Mississippi Delta, Arkansas, I know the nut all oaks are big late season, uh, water oaks, uh, pin oaks, maybe. I don't hunt over there much, but that's just what I've heard. I've heard a lot of people say that uh, overcup oaks are not preferred. I don't know if y'all got many of them. I don't, I'm trying to think. Uh, we don't have many around I here. think I've only seen one in Alabama, but when I've gone to Arkansas, they're everywhere in Arkansas. And it's like, I've seen some. Everybody I know over there that says that the deer don't mess with them. And I got a buddy in Mississippi that said the same thing. The deer don't really mess with them much. That's kind of how mountain you think oaks are in, for us. Same here. Yeah, the chestnut oaks. That That's funny because the overcup and the chestnut oak are both white oaks. Yeah. And you think, well, it's in the white oak family. It's it's going to, the deer going to like it. Those two. You just lay on the ground and rot or sprout. Like if you get a good rain late October, all those chestnut oaks start sprouting. Like, yeah, I mean the deer eat them if it's the only thing there. But by that time, if you got chestnut oaks, you've probably got other types of oaks and the deer are eating instead. Yeah. Yeah. We did find but one I mean, instance in Georgia this September where they were feeding on those chestnut oaks pretty hard or we call them mountain oaks. Some people call them rock oaks. Uh, but that, that I mean, that's yeah. one of the, I could count on one t- one hand how many times I've seen that. I mean, it's yeah. pretty rare. They just don't, they just don't really seem to like them, which is weird because it's like they a giant acre too. Like it's like a huge, big old meaty acre falling off that tree. I'm like, <laughs> man, they ought to love this. They eat like 10 of them and be full, you know? But they don't, yeah, they don't know why. I don't, I don't know. And the same with the, same with the overcups. They're pretty big acorns and they got a big cap on them, but but that ain't nothing to a deer. They just don't seem to favor them for whatever reason. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I have noticed that. That's kind of why I like, uh, why I went to learn all the, all the oaks that grow around here is because, you know, I, I don't want to just look at every acorn like it's the same thing because there are those certain ones in certain areas that the deer just don't seem to really like that much. You know, around here, the top three that I've seen that, besides the Schumard oak, that's a red oak, but top three white oaks around here is a white oak, Chinkapin oak and uh, uh, swamp chestnut oak, which you find them on the river in certain certain places. They're kind of spotty around here, but uh, that's that's a deer chocolate right there. Yeah, and see, a lot of people will confuse like if I put like I posted a, a video on our story a couple of days ago of a couple mountain oaks, these mountain chestnut oaks that are dropping, and the acorn looks very very similar to a, a swamp chestnut, just like kind of size wise. 
and some guys thought I was talking about swamp chestnuts because I was mentioning like these deer don't eat these things like really ever if there's anything yeah. else out there mass crop wise. The leaves, the leaves are very similar too. Yeah, it, but it's just like the habitat they're in. You know, this is higher elevation, rockier soil, at least typically like where we find them at. Uh, a lot of your big ridge tops. Yeah, will have I've never them. found them. I've never found a chestnut oak outside of uh, ridges. Yep. And hardwood ridges. But then you talk to these guys talking about swamp chestnuts, and clearly, you know, swamp chestnuts are a lot more preferred food source in the areas they actually grow in, but they're definitely not they the same the species. Yeah, they're definitely not the not same at species all. at all. They and, grow, I actually know a spot where um where the river bottom meets the hill country. You can go up in those hills. It's private property in this one spot I'm talking about. So I didn't go up on the hills, but I know you'd find some chestnut oaks if you went up on those ridges. And right down, it just comes down, and then it's just flat all the way to the river about a mile. And there's swamp chestnut oaks there. So you can find the two growing close together, but they're still completely different habitat. Yeah. And and the deer definitely prefer the swamp variety. Um, it just, that I don't know why it is um, deer prefer one over the other. I mean, a Schumard oak's in the, in the red oak family, so it's a lot more bitter than a white oak, but they're, I mean... I've killed a deer over them over them when deer were hitting white oaks, but not in that one spot. Like I had checked some some white oaks and they weren't dropping, but there was a big old shumard oak dropping a bunch. And sure enough, the does were coming in there and feeding on it. When right down the road, the deer were hot on the white oaks. So yeah, I mean, you gotta like I said, you gotta if you got acorns on the ground, check them. Look for the look for that fresh deer sign, no matter what type of acorn it is. Yeah. Now I want to kind of transition over. I know we talked a lot about bow hunting and that was definitely something that I really wanted to kind of hash out, like, you know, kind of entry level into bow hunting, you know, starting having more opportunities, you know, for people that are kind of really trying to get started bow hunting. But I do want to talk about, you know, for somebody also is going to be willing to pick up a rifle, pick up a muzzleloader, you know, when those seasons open, how does your thought process change at those times of seasons when, when you can, you know, have a little bit more range? I mean, do you still hug tight to that thick cover? Do you step back a little bit? Like kind of what goes through your mind? Because you mentioned early on that you kind of transition a little bit more to, to terrain and topography at that point, but walk us through, like, how does your mindset change when you pick up a rifle compared to like when you're picking up a bow? So we have two weeks of muzzleloader before rifle here. That's peak rut. Like when muzzleloader season's in, I might pop a doe if she blows at me or something. But when muzzleloader season's in, I'm buck hunting. It's the rut. So I'm hunting the the funnels, the downwind side of bedding, any any kind of place where deer are likely to travel through chasing or checking for does. And then uh rifle comes in, it's late rut. I'm still buck hunting. So it's kind of that transition area. Plus, there's a lot of hunting pressure, you know, opening week of rifle a lot of people in the woods a lot of people during muzzleloader too so at that point i'm starting to focus more on hunting pressure as well as where the deer are at so you know a spot that maybe was good for both season and good during the early rut maybe there's you know five different guys hunting in there all of a sudden and so i'm going to move on so i start hunting the hunters more and then i do towards late season december uh i start scouting new areas still hunting i do a lot more still hunting I, I do a lot more hunting off the ground where i'm just kind of just poking around and seeing what i see i'll get it more into the hill country i like hunting the hills uh, during gun season and um just because i can you know it's open hardwoods and i can see a good ways and use the i'm hunting terrain instead of instead of a specific cover or funnels i'm not trying to get 20 yards from them anymore which i funny thing is i often end up within bow range of deer during gun season anyways also uh fields the crop fields are they're they're cutting crops right now everything's bare everything's dry brown not a single green leaf in the fields we'll get some rain here over the next couple months they'll either sow a cover crop or they'll just let the weeds come back up and the green the fields will be green by december and then again, I'm paying attention to hunting pressure. If we get a, if there's a field that's been overlooked, haven't seen no fresh tire tracks, you know, hasn't been hunted much, I'll start hunting fields during rifle season. As long as the deer aren't being pressured, they'll they'll hit those green fields late season, uh, before dark. And uh, if, uh, bad weather too. If you get several days of bad weather, go out there in the rain. Uh, so the deer know that people haven't been there. They'll come out. They'll come out there in the rain before dark. 
Interesting. Now, also, are you paying attention to any other kind of uh, sign, you know, during muzzleloader or gun season? Or is it just trying to set yourself up in some of those funnels that's, you know, going to bring deer through a general area that you're going to have an opportunity at? Uh, during muzzleloader, I mean, I'm looking, uh, I pay attention to buck sign. I don't have to be hunting over a rub line, but if I find a fresh rub line, there's probably a buck that's got a hot doe in there. Like if, if I was in there four days ago and there was no rubs and I come in and there's 12 rubs in a row, well, there might be a big, a big deer in there with a doe locked down trying to keep the other bucks out. Um, just rubbing every tree around. So yeah, if, if I'm seeing hot buck sign, I'll, I'll probably capitalize on it. Um, deer still eat acorns. They still got to feed. I mean, even during peak breeding, you still got deer doing deer things. So I'm, I'm paying attention to that, but I've also like going back a while where I said there's certain places I'll stay out of until the rut. That's when I move in with the muzzle loader uh, to some of those places I've been saving. Cause I know they're either could be a good one or, there is a good one in there or you know if i think i have a chance of seeing a good one and there's a lot of does and i know there's going to be bucks in there when those does come in you know uh, there are spots that i've saved that i've either found last year in some cases or that i found this year during bow season that i decided to stay out of because i thought it'd be a good rut spot um that's kind of so i don't do as much scouting during during muzzle loader but i will poke around in just a pants now jonathan one another thing i've got a question on i know you have had success killing some deer on the ground in some of those cedar thickets when would you ever push into cover like that you know with with a muzzle or with a rifle and like is it based off hunting pressure you'll kind of suck tighter to that stuff or is it just based on certain conditions you'd actually push into some of that cover uh hunting pressure for sure i don't hunt inside cedar thickets as often as i used to that used to be one of my favorite places during gun season to go kill one because it's silent it's good bedding cover they can move through there like a ghost never hear a sound uh, so it's a good good place to catch doe slipping or bucks depending on where you're at um i do get picked off easily it's hard i mean you got cedar trees about this wide and not much other cover there's no food for them because it's completely shaded there's nothing growing down there uh, sometimes you'll find the cedar thicket broken up with some oaks in there and you might find some acorns, but, uh, those solid cedar thickets where you're standing up and you can't see 10 feet, but you sit down and you can see about 40 yards. I've killed a bunch of deer, a bunch of does in places like that, but it's easy to get picked off. It's easy for deer to sneak up on you. They do like to use those as travel and bedding areas. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth a shot. If you're just trying to get in some deer, go sit. If you got deer sign around, you know, don't just see a cedar thicket and go hunting. Go like poke around it one day, and when you got time, and see if you can find some good deer trails or droppings. You know, something that tells you they're in there, and then find you some cover. You may have to make a makeshift blind out of sticks or something. But um, yeah, cedar thickets can be good. I just don't hunt them as much as I used to. Uh, Jonathan, another thing I've got for you. When it comes to bow hunting, getting ready for like when the muzzler season opens, because muzzler opens for you guys before gun season does, are you taking consideration what you're seeing during mu or during bow season as where you may set up during uh, muzzler season? Like, are you taking the information you're learning like last week or two of bow season to kind of roll into muzzler season, uh, especially if it's an okay. area that maybe you're not super knowledgeable on? Maybe it's a newer area that you've been trying to hunt for throughout the season. Um, yeah, for sure. I actually just the other day I shot a doe. I went in there just to, you know, found a new spot. Actually, the day before that, it was a Sunday. Me and a buddy were out there and I was, you know, I'd map scouted. This looks good. Great uh, mix of habitat. A little bit of everything, pretty much. It's like a good looking spot on the map, but um, let's go in and actually hunt. So I dropped my buddy off. I was like, there's some big red oaks and then there's some pines. And like go back in there, see what you see, pick a spot and climb. Then I go on, I I go on down a ways and um, and I find some swamp chestnut oaks that have got deer sign on them. But they're like, I think, I think the deer were coming out there after dark. But well, that's beside the point. We hunted these these two new spots. We're probably about half a mile apart. Never been in there before. He he was covered up in does. And he ended up missing one. 
So he had to leave. He couldn't hunt the next day. It was Monday. I'm off Mondays. So I go back in there Monday afternoon because uh, when I went in where he was at, I found uh, two fresh scrapes under one chinkapin oak loaded with acorns. And it had a low-hanging branch, and there's like a little clearing that kind of went straight down. And uh, it's right on the edge of the clearing, low-hanging branch, acorns everywhere, and two fresh scrapes. One of them, one of them still had pee in it. Like, I don't know. I don't know if they were mock scrapes or not, but I went in the next day and found two cell cameras on it that I hadn't seen the day before. So I was already there. I was already committed. So I went and climbed up, saw like four or five different bucks, four or five different does, shot a doe, got her out of there. And I said, all right. I'm coming back here, but I'm probably going to wait till muzzleloader because I'm seeing like nice two-year-old bucks. Uh, one of them was probably 18 inches wide, just no tines on him. I was like, there's got to be a good one in here. There's just bucks and does crawling in here. Somebody else is hunting here too, so that that may be a factor. I may have an issue. Like I might, I might not be able to hunt it during muzzleloader because some dude's in there every day. I don't know. Uh, depends on what the other hunter does but if i've got that spot to myself one day in, in early mid-november that's i'm staying out. i killed my doe i'm staying out of there until until the time is right that's one of those places i just found and and I'm, i killed my deer i'm getting out of there and and hopefully it's good but i try to again there you know there's hunting pressure on public so somebody's somebody's got cameras in there I'm, i may have to abandon that spot and go to another place that's why i try to scout as much as I can. Jonathan, uh, this is a side note, uh, cause I want to get a point of wrapping up. I, we've had a really good conversation, but I want to reminisce on a, a hunt that you, me did. Uh, it was my first saddle hunt ever. I don't know if you remember that. It's on the channel. We went out during the rain and I didn't have a platform. Man, I forgot about I that. Didn't ha- I didn't have a platform. I didn't have anything. I think you had been saddle hunting for a little bit. It was my first year. I think it was back 2018. And, uh, cause I'd ran into on a piece of public land, uh, while I was out scouting, you were coming out scouting too. Uh, and it, we decided to go do a hunt and I don't know if you remember, we walked into a spot and since I didn't have a platform, I think you had just told me just climb the tree and kind of use the top of your stick. I was using some old lone wolf alternating. I know, I know that spot. I was just there the other day. Well, well, well <laughs> what I wanted to get to was, I don't know if you remember, because again, we sat pretty close, but I had never been more miserable in my entire life because I did not know how to set up in a saddle. Like, not been saddle hunting now for five years and plenty comfortable. Well, it was just out, of, just out of the box that day. <laughs> yeah, it was literally just out of the box, never used the thing. I think I had, used a single step as your platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I climbed this tree. We and him, had, we were sitting not, I don't know, we weren't far from each other at all. And uh, I climbed up that freaking tree, dude, got hung up. Didn't again did not have a platform. This is the importance of having a platform, everybody. I had one step, like one right hand step on an alternating lone wolf stick, okay, that I'd had for like eight years. And I had literally I was in so much pain. It was not even funny, dude. It was it was raining on us. I don't think we saw any deer. We might have some deer blow at us, I think, right when we got down. Um uh, Yeah, that spot sucks because the, the thermals drop into that bedding spot there. Yeah, because you had the pines and everything, all that thick covered down below us, and you know we're sitting on some oaks right there. But uh, it is funny, kind of thinking back. I just thought about that, but like it, it shows the importance of you know. By the way, guys, if you get some new gear this year, go try it out before you actually go in the woods to hunt with it. First off, make sure you're safe with it and you understand how to use it. But like with the saddle, there's a very specific way to sit, and the, the way to sit on a saddle is not hugging up against the tree because you don't have a platform. Okay, <laughs> I promise you, you will lose blood circulation in your legs at some point if you do that. So yeah, that was a good lesson I learned on that on that hunt back in that day. But that's still on the YouTube. Yeah, definitely channel. give it a test run. Yeah, give it a test run. If you're getting a brand new stand or a brand new saddle or whatever, take it out to a tree somewhere. Just give it a test run. Make sure you're comfortable and know how to set it up. Make sure you, uh, make sure you don't forget your strap like I did the other day. <laughs> I went out, got a brand new platform and went out to, um, to go climb up, had my stuff unpacked. It was like, well, I left the strap in the truck. So I, uh, went and sat up under a dead ash tree that hundred percent dead. I mean, sawdust on the base of it. Like probably shouldn't be sitting under this, but Ended up killing a doe off the ground that evening, but I would have rather been in a tree. Uh, sometimes you got to make do with what you got. Dude, the the wise words of a killer, you know, <laughs> you know. Sometimes you give me the tree, but you know, just sit on the ground, shoot one off the ground, it doesn't really matter. But uh, <laughs> Jonathan, uh, as a point of wrapping up here, man, I really enjoyed the conversation. Well, before we do, Andrew, you got any questions? No, I got, I got. Okay. Um, 
Jonathan, as a point of wrapping up, you know, of course you got your YouTube channel, so I want you to plug your YouTube channel. Guys can go and watch a bunch of your hunts. You put out a ton of video content. Plus, you can go watch my hunt that when I hunted with Jonathan back in 2018. You got to scroll back a long ways. But uh, Jonathan, uh, of course, mentioned the channel where guys can kind of follow along with you on social media and, and likewise. Uh, sorry, follow me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Catman Outdoors on YouTube. Same thing on Instagram. I think it's, uh, handle is Catman529 on Instagram. Catman Outdoors on uh, Facebook. And CatmanOutdoors.com for the Oak Tree Guide. And I've got a couple of recipes on there. I don't have a lot on the website, but the Oak Tree Guide's on there. And uh, a couple of jerky recipes. Um, I got TikTok as well. I think it's Catman529 Outdoors. I don't post a whole lot on there. Every now and again, I'll post a few videos. But the main thing is uh, you'll find me on YouTube and then my website. Absolutely. Well, guys, if you're not already following Jonathan, go give him a follow. But I'm sure a lot of you guys already do follow him. But Jonathan, greatly appreciate you joining us on this week's podcast episode. Guys, if you've enjoyed this episode, go share it with a couple buddies. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure you're also subscribed to the podcast. Leave us a five-star written review if you've enjoyed this episode. And, uh, guys, we'll catch you back on the next episode from the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. Y'all stay Southern.